So we are going to uh, finish our series this morning on what child is this through this, this Christmas season as we've been uh, asking this question that this famous uh, Christmas carol asks, and that is what child is this? Again, we sang this song this morning. We, in fact, started our service off with this song. If you've been here with us through this whole series, you might be tired of this song by now because um, we have sang it every time. Um, but it raises an important question. Right, of what child is this? What is special about this child? Right? And uh, so we've been looking at different characters of the Christmas story and the attributes of them and what do they bring into the story? Why were they invited into the story? Again, and how do they an- help us to answer this question of what child is this? Uh, and so as we do that, we're going to uh, jump in today as we look at the character of Joseph, and he's the last one we're looking at this year. Uh, And so um, as we get into our message, I hope you found your message outline in the bulletin as you came in today. And so we'll be going through different passages, and uh, I encourage you to to open your own Bible with me as we see these. If you don't have your own Bible, there are Bibles available for you in the seat pockets in front of you. And on the message outline is the page numbers in that Bible of where you can find these verses. So, but we are, again, continuing to ask and look at this question of what child is this? Now, when we started this series um, five weeks ago, I presented to you as well as myself a challenge, and that challenge was to look at the Christmas story with fresh eyes. Because it is a familiar story, because we celebrate it every year, and even if you're um, not a follower of Jesus, we all know this story. Right? We've heard it, we've seen uh, you know, so many movies and plays and and things portray the Christmas story. In fact, we see nativity scenes around us all the time, and, and it's a great um, part of celebrating Christmas every year. But at the same time, it's easy to kind of sit back and say, you know, I've heard this story before. I know what happens. I, I've, I, you know, I know what's coming. And so the temptation, I think, can be to kind of sit back and, and enjoy the, the, the festivities of the season, right, and, and to not continue to journey forward in our faith as we study this very familiar story. And so the challenge, right, was to come to this story this year with fresh eyes, right, and to come to the, to the scripture and to, again, these different perspectives that these uh, Christmas story characters bring. And we've looked, we started with looking at the shepherds, right, and why they were invited into the story and what they taught us about the Christ child. Then we looked at the wise men. And then last week, we started into the, the two most central and famous characters of the Christmas story, and that was Mary and Joseph. We saw last week, again, we, uh, at Mary and at her experience, right, and the things that, that she would have worked through. Um, and then this week, we are concluding by looking at Joseph. Now, Joseph is a bit of a mystery, truthfully. Okay, now, if, even when you go back to the famous Christmas carol, What Child Is This?, the truth is all the other characters are mentioned in the song, and Joseph isn't. Hey, and, and truthfully, um, Joseph is kind of a mystery biblically as well. When we look at the scriptures and look at, uh, again, what role he plays, he obviously plays a prominent role in the Christmas story. And yet, um, there's not a lot of scripture that is dedicated to Joseph or even tells us about Joseph. In fact, um, none of Joseph's words are ever quoted in scripture. Hey, um, he's, he's never directly quoted, yet all of Again, many people are, but he's not. Um, in fact, he's literally not even mentioned in the Gospel of Mark at all. His name's not even in it. And so when we look at, again, th- uh, three out of the four Gospels talk about Joseph, but he is never directly quoted. Okay? Um, and his words are never recorded. Only his actions right, and his obedience, his care for his family, And the fact that he was present in a lot of these things is mentioned. Okay, but that's all we have. And so when we look at the person of Joseph, we have to kind of put some of these pieces together, right? And and look at what we can learn about Joseph and the influence that he had in Jesus' life. And so as we start putting some of those pieces together this morning, um, we, um, again, we'll look at... Joseph and his interaction with Jesus and the relationship that they had with each other. And as we do that, we're going to actually start at the public portion of Jesus' ministry and work our way backwards to the Christmas story. So the first, at first we're going to look at, again, um, in Jesus, in his public ministry, in the Gospel of John. Right? But as we do that, we're starting with this premise of the fact that we see 
um, most definitely, without a doubt, that Joseph was definitely known as Jesus' earthly father. Okay, we saw last week in an interaction with Mary that, that, that the Christ child was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that Mary was the only human DNA physical tie, right, that, that Jesus had um, to add to his 100%, you know, human attributes, but he was also 100% divine, and that he was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Again, Joseph had no physical tie to Jesus, and yet he was known very clearly as his earthly father. Uh, we're, look at this. We're going to start in John chapter 1, verses 43 through 45. And this is where, um, where Jesus is, starts gathering some of his disciples. John 1, 43 through 45. Again, this is where Jesus is starting to gather his disciples as he starts his public ministry. It says, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. And Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Again, in their culture, as we saw last week, they are a very male-centered culture. In fact, and it was a very family-centered culture. And therefore, the male of the family, the dad figure, the father figure in the family, right, everything rested on him. Hey, and, and everybody's even family identity and their trade. I mean, everything was connected to the, to, the, to the paternal person of the family unit. And so as we see, again, Jesus' earthly reputation, right, was he was the son of Joseph. Hey, so Mary and Joseph, again, were, um, were the family unit that he was identified with. And as we see, they say, hey, we found this is the guy. He says he's the Messiah. We think it's really him. And he is the son of Joseph. Yeah, we see this um, kind of play out a little later in Jesus' public ministry in John chapter 6, okay, where it says, Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because he said, and he being Jesus, said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and his mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? Again, Joseph was his earthly father. Everybody knew that, right? They knew his parents. Okay, we see this, and yet they were struggling with some of the claims he made as the Messiah. Right, it's saying, again, he claimed, I came down from heaven. And I put, no, you didn't, because we know your parents. Right, and your parents were Mary and Joseph. Joseph was most definitely Jesus' earthly father. Okay, also, as we continue to put these pieces together and figure this out, okay, we know that Joseph and, and Jesus had a fairly close relationship. Okay, because before he started his public ministry, right, Jesus uh, was a carpenter. Okay? And in, again, in their culture, every Jewish boy would have started out um, going through religious training. Okay? And, and every boy did that. They, were, they would have gone to the temple. They would have learned. They would have studied. And then there was a point um, when, uh, when they were around 12 years of old, which, which is, again, in the Jewish culture is when they have their bar mitzvah. And at that point is where they get either chosen to continue in their religious training and become a religious leader of the day, or they are released from that training to go learn a trade. And again, in a family-centered culture, the trade they would learn was whatever their dad did. Okay, and we see that, again, even with the disciples, as some, several of them were fishermen as they were being apprenticed by their fathers, right, to be fishermen. And Jesus was apprenticed by Joseph to be a carpenter. Right, and so he was, again, would have worked very closely with his father, Joseph, okay, and to learn the trade, uh, the trade of the family, okay, and to be a carpenter. And, and we see that now, this, an interesting side note of that is the fact that Jesus, the, the Messiah, right, sent from God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, did not pass the test to, be, to continue in his religious leader training right, as a 12-year-old. It's because he was a carpenter. He was, he was apprenticed as a carpenter. Um, again, just an interesting side note. With that said is, again, we see Joseph's influence in Jesus' life, even as a, a, a 12-year-old boy. And we do not have a lot of biblical evidence um, or, or stories that, that look into Jesus' childhood. Again, the Christmas story kind of spans the first three to four years of Jesus' life. And then there's, there's a hole in the rest of kind of Jesus' childhood until the, except for one story. Okay, in this one story we find um, in Luke chapter 2, 
Okay, and this was when um, he was about 12 years old, and this is right where he, the time where he would have been started moving off and to be apprenticed as a carpenter. Um, but again, within a Jewish family, um, they would have gone every year to Jerusalem, to the temple, to give their sacrifices, right, and to worship. And, and, and again, Mary and Joseph did this. They took their family there. And, and after they were there, they were on their way home, and about a day back in their journey, realized that Jesus was not with them. They, and, and again, as a parent, I know we look at this and be like, wow, Mary and Joseph get the Parent of the Year Award right here, right? Um, they, you know, here, they left their kid, right, in the temple for, for days, right? And, and yet, although, as a parent, we understand how easily kids can, can you know, disappear or, or you know, run off. Um, and also now they were traveling. It says they were traveling with a lot of extended family. And, and, there's a, and again, I'm sure they would have thought, oh, he's, he's with his cousins. You know, they're always off goofing around, right, or whatever. And then kind of that later that they come to dinner, like, wait a minute, where, Jesus didn't come to dinner, where is he, right, and then realize, like, nobody can find him, right, so they go back to Jerusalem, okay, and they find him in the temple, and they find him kind of talking and learning and even arguing with the religious leaders in the temple, okay, and then we see Mary's reaction here in Luke chapter 2, verse 48, okay, where it says, and his parents didn't know what to think, and son, his mother, said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. Okay, now, obviously, Joseph was present in this situation. Again, he, he's not quoted here. This is, it's Mary who's quoted, and she's giving him a stern talking to, right? And, and yet, but Joseph was there, and he was helping to search, right? He was just as frantic as Mary was. And again, Jesus was 12 years old at this point, um, and this is the last place that Joseph's physical presence is mentioned in Scripture. Hey, and at, at some point um, between this passage, when Jesus was 12, and when Jesus started his public ministry, Joseph um, leaves, right? He, he's, he's gone. Um, he's not present during Jesus' public ministry. Again, popular opinion among biblical scholars is that Jesus, or Joseph likely died somewhere in between apprenticing Jesus as a carpenter and when Jesus was 30 years old. And again, we don't know that, again, but just per historical record and just putting all the pieces together, that is the assumption. Because we know that he was not there when Jesus entered his public ministry. And so now we're all the way back then to the start of Joseph's story and where he enters into the biblical narrative. And that is to the Christmas story, which is going to be our base text for this morning, which is found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. So we're going to jump into the story there. Hey, Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. And it says, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when, Jesus, and when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. So as we look at this passage, and again, this, this dream, again, that Joseph had, um, it is very significant that there are two different places in this passage um, that Joseph is told specifically that he will give the child the name, Jesus. Hey, again, in their culture, in their male-centered, family-centered culture, hey, it, was, it was the father's job to name the son or the child, whatever child was given. Again, if the father did not name the child, right, then that child would have been culturally was an orphan. Because again, the, the male was the center of the family. Right? And, and it was very important, again, that, 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 was, that the father did that because that is how the father claimed the child. Hey, if the father didn't do that, then they would have been treated as an orphan in their culture. 
And as we think about this, we realize that Joseph is the only person, other than Mary, that knew the truth about where this baby had come from. Okay, the public opinion of Joseph, right, would have been very similar to the public opinion of Mary. Right, and we looked at that last week, and the fact that the public opinion of Mary would have been exactly the opposite of why God picked her. Right, God picked her because of her, her, her purity and her commitment. Right, and everybody else, when she shows up pregnant in the middle of their engagement period, would have assumed the opposite of her. Hey, and the same is true of Joseph. Right, because Joseph is the man, right, who is engaged to be married to Mary, and then she shows up pregnant before their marriage is finalized. Right, which means that, again, there's only kind of two possibilities how that happened. Right, again, the, the public opinion would have been that, that it was probably Joseph's baby. Right, which means that his purity and his commitment to his faith Right, and to, to their, their, their cultural norms, all those things would have been just as in question as Mary's. Right, or if he, the other um, you know, explanation, right, is the fact that the baby is not Joseph's. Right, which means then that he would have done exactly what he, this pastor says he intended to do, and that is to kind of just get rid of Mary quietly and, you know, not shame her, but I'm not going to ruin my life, right, because of what happened with this girl. Right, and yet the baby says doing that. And so by him taking Jesus and naming him and adopting Jesus as his own, which means now the public opinion is this is Joseph's baby. Right, which means he is implicated in his public opinion of him as much as Mary is. Right, and, and so Joseph took on a lot of responsibility in that. And yet he is the only person, right, that really knew the truth. Right, because at that point, think about it, they couldn't even say the truth to people. Right, because you know, again, what the public opinion would have been. It was like, oh, wow, isn't that convenient? Right, I'm sure, you know, you got, sure, the Holy Spirit conceived the baby. Yeah, you're just covering yourself, right, to keep yourself from public shame. And in fact, if they would have told the truth to people, right, nobody would have believed them. Right, and so, again, Joseph gets implicated just as much as Mary, right, with that when he adopts Jesus as his own child. And that's exactly what Joseph did. And just like we've done in previous weeks, um, I wanna show you this video again that is, portrays Joseph's perspective in this whole story. Yeah, I reckon I've caught at least a dozen of these. Made my first one for my, my baby boy. Well, it's, it, well, it's gonna be an angel. At least the way I remember it. That was a long time ago. See, my, my, my boy, well, before he got born, I really didn't know who he was gonna look like. That worried me. Well, see, his mama, she found out she was pregnant, and I didn't want to embarrass her. Maybe it wasn't mine. I just thought I was gonna let her go without making a fuss, you know. But then one night I had this dream, and there was an angel in it. And that angel, he told me I shouldn't be scared to marry that woman because it, uh, it was God's baby that Mary was having. You know, around here, we, we, we got a custom. When a baby gets born, the daddy, he puts that baby across his knees and that's his way of telling everybody that that baby is his. Well, it took a while for my heart to kind of get used to the idea that that baby is just on loan to me, and he was special. But, uh, well, I made room for him. And when he got born, I did what any daddy would do. I put that boy on my knee, I gave him a name, I called him mine. But he grew up to a fine boy. Now, all these years later, well, you probably heard about him. <laughs> He's grown into a fine man. You know, every time I called one of these, I remember what that angel told me 
That Mary's boy, my, my boy, and we, we're supposed to call him God with us. God with us. Yeah. I reckon that's all I've ever really needed to know. So you ask me who my boy looks like, I'll tell you. He looks like God. You know, we, again, think about that perspective. And again, as if you're a dad, again, and I can tell you as a dad, as a dad, we worry about a lot of different things. Sometimes things that maybe you don't realize until you're a dad. And, you know, thinking of that perspective as, as a dad, he's thinking, you know, I don't know. Who's he going to look like? Right? He's not really mine. Right, and yet, as we, you know, see, again, the, the idea that Joseph serves, again, a, as a great example for us in a lot of ways, and especially in answering this question, what child is this? Again, he took certainly a backseat role in the biblical narrative, but yet he was at front and center when it comes to the implications of Jesus' life. Right, and, and he led the way, again, in in truly living out the gospel message, right? As, as he adopted Jesus as his own son, brought him into his family, right? And, and poured everything he had into raising him, right? And, and with that, again, what, so what child is this? Again, how does Joseph help us answer this question? Well, there's a, a few attributes of Jesus I want to point out, again, that start with Joseph. And that first one is this is that he is the one who adopts and names us as a part of his own family. Again, what child is this? Well, he is the one who adopts us, right, and names us as a part of, of his family, of God's family. Again, Joseph adopted Jesus, right, took him into his family. Right, he didn't have to do that, but he did. And we see in Galatians chapter 4, okay, it says, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman and subject to the law. And God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. And now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Again, as we look at this, again, the concept that Galatians teaches us and, and what we see in the Christ child and in the, in the Christmas story, right, is that again, Jesus was sent, right, to earth as the Messiah so that we could become children of God. Because the truth is we're all created by God. Okay, we are all God's creation. And again, whether we acknowledge that God is real or not, it doesn't change the fact that we are God's creation. Everybody, all of us are God's creation. Right, and God's intention is that we are all in his family, right, that he wants to save us, right, and to be his family. And yet because of the fall, because of sin in our life, we are separated from God, right? And, and when we receive Christ as our Savior, when we follow Jesus, right, then we move from God's creation to God's child, right? And God's plan of redemption, right, plays out in our own lives, Right, and we are adopted back into his family. And again, and just as this says, as when you are God's child, then you also are within our God's heir. Again, we are an heir to the kingdom, to God's kingdom, to his eternal kingdom, right, in heaven. So no, we see, again, what child is this? Well, he's the one that adopts and names us as a part of his family if we choose to follow Christ. But again, he's the one that does that, but yet he's also the one that makes it possible. Without Jesus, adoption into God's family is not possible for us. Again, scripture tells us the wage of sin is death, right? but the gift of God is eternal life. 
through Christ Jesus our Lord. Right, again, we can be saved because of Christ. Again, another verse that's not in your outline that you should just write down in the reference to you is John 14, 6, right, which is where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right, he is the one that makes it possible. Okay, because this Christ child that we are celebrating this weekend, again, just as Joseph said in the video, he grew up to be a fine man. Right? And that man went to the cross to pay our sin debt so that we could become child of God and, and become an heir to his throne, right? to his eternal throne in heaven. Again, this is, I mean, exactly what the angel tells Joseph in the passage that we read this morning. Right? In verse 21, he says, And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Right? The mission of the Messiah was very clear from the very beginning. Right? That was God's plan to redeem his creation. Right? It was through the Messiah. And it was through this Christ child. And, and again, God, through this angel, told Joseph that very clearly. In fact, the literal translation of the name Jesus is God saves, right? And that was the whole point of Jesus' earthly life, why it was to save us. Because God does save, and God adopts us as his own and for his own by the power of the Holy Spirit through the ministry of Jesus Christ on this earth. In Romans 6, 14 through 16, tells us, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Again, in, in the, the, the Easter story, when Jesus goes to the cross, it says, again, when he died on the cross, that the veil was torn. And again, the veil is talking about there was a, a veil, a curtain, that was in the temple in Jerusalem. In the innermost room was called the Holy of Holies. Okay, and that was where God's presence was before the cross. Okay, now again, that's why they even had to go to the temple and to worship and have sacrifices, because that's where God's Holy Spirit lived, was in the Holy of Holies. And yet, when Christ died on the cross, right, it says the veil was torn. And that is hugely symbolic, right, of the fact that after the cross, right, that now God's presence is in the heart of every believer. And we don't have to go to a temple anymore. We don't have to offer sacrifices because Christ was our sacrifice, right? He paid our way. And now, just as this verse says, the Holy Spirit lives in the heart of every believer, right? And, and, and that is made possible, right, because we are adopted as his children, Right, and that becomes, again, the family identity is the fact, right, that we have the Holy Spirit living within us and helping us with every day as we journey forward to him as believers. Hey, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Hey, you notice what God wants to redeem every one of us, right? And you bring God great pleasure. Hey, so many times I know in our life, even as a believer, I can, I feel that guilt and be like, man, I don't know, God just maybe is so disappointed in me. I messed up again. Right? But that's the truth. The truth is, is I bring God great pleasure and you bring God great pleasure because he loves you, right? And he loves you enough to send his son, right? And the, the plan of redemption to save you, right? And you bring God great pleasure. So again, Christ, who is, what child is this? He's the one who adopts and names us as a part of his family. He's the one that makes adoption to his family possible. And he's also the one who enables adoption into God's family and will, will give a new identity to those who accept his gift. Again, when we receive the free gift of salvation, right, we get a new identity. 
In fact, that's why we give gifts at Christmas. That's why it's a part of our cultural celebration is because it, it illustrates the um, incredible gift that God gives all of us in the Christ child. Right? And when we receive that gift, when we open our life, when we pray and accept Christ as our Savior and ask God to save us, he saves us. And at that point, we receive that gift. And when we are saved, we get a new identity. Again, it's described, it's one way in Revelation chapter 2, okay, verse, seven, verse 17, okay, where it says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give it to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Again, when we find victory in Christ, we get a new name. Okay, we get a new identity. A, a, a little different way that it's said, again, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says this means if anyone belongs to Christ, they have become a new person. The old life is gone, and the new life has begun. Right, if we receive that gift of salvation, right, then we get a new identity. Our old identity is gone. Right? And we start living into our new identity, and our new identity is God's child. Because he has adopted us into his family. Right? And, and again, uh, our, our, our mission statement here at Oregon Trail is join the journey. Right? And we join the journey when we receive Christ as our Savior, when we accept that gift of salvation. And then we continue to join the journey every day as we figure out what we're supposed to do as this new creation. Right, and with every day we journey closer and closer to Christ as we start to understand more about who God is and more about what Christ has done and, and more about how we live that out in our time here on earth. And we continue to journey every day. Again, accepting Christ as our Savior starts our journey. That does not end until we are with God in heaven in his unhindered presence. And so this Christmas, right, whether you have never received Christ as your Savior, our hope is that you will join the journey today. You receive Christ, receive this ultimate gift of salvation, right? And, just, and you do that by just by praying to God and asking him to come into your life. Right? And saying, Lord, I, I, I confess that I've sinned. I, I believe that Jesus was the Messiah and he died on the cross and rose again to forgive my sin debt. Please forgive me and enter in my life. All right, and that's how you join the journey. And then, again, even if you have been a Christian for your entire life at this point, I hope that this Christmas has brought fresh eyes to the fact that we need to continue to journey with Christ. Right? That we take a new step in our journey every day that we serve him. Because there are lots of answers to this question, what child is this? And again, as we've seen through the shepherds, through the wise men, through Mary, and now today through Joseph, Right, that there are so many questions or answers to this question about what child is this. And now as we sum this all up and as we, we celebrate these next few days, this Christmas holiday, again, let's answer the ultimate question of what child is this. And we've got one last summary video as we tie it all together and answer this question, what child is this? I've always wondered I'd been at the stable that night. Would I have seen a king or just a baby? If I'd stood there with the shepherds listening to stories about choirs of angels, would I have asked, what child is this? Or would I have known that he someday would be the shepherd of all? If I'd watched wise men bring valuable gifts and kneel down under the guard of heavenly wonders, would I have understood that he was the one in whom I'd find all wisdom. And that he was the greatest gift of all. Just as that baby was held by his mother. He would hold me. He would hold me with his amazing grace. And his adoption by his father Joseph would be a picture of my adoption into God's family. Who could comprehend that this baby who was defenseless, swaddled, in hell, would someday be the one holding me in his hands. I didn't witness a star moving across the sky. Or scores of angels proclaiming his birth. But somehow in the middle of my ordinary world, this extraordinary baby's birth found a place in my worn down, beat up heart. 
So like all those people who saw him. He's the one I've been waiting for. To repair me. Redeem me. Love me. Forgive me. Comfort me. Help me. Die for me. Raise me to life. So what child is this? He's the one who comes to save me. He's the one who comes to save me. To save me. To save me. He's the one who comes to save me. So what child is this? He's the one that came to save me. Right, and that answer, right, encompasses everything. Again, and I hope this morning is that as we celebrate Christmas, as you take these next few days and enjoy our family and our friends and, and, and all that comes with the holiday, right, that we will not forget, right, as we focus on the Christ child that he was the one that came to save us. And again, my hope this morning is that you will not leave here without accepting Christ as your savior, why, without being saved by that child. And even if you have been saved for a long time, that you will leave here knowing, again, that I'm going to continue to journey, right? And that I'm going to be closer to Christ every day because... This child means everything. So we're going to conclude our service this morning by singing one more Christmas carol. Okay, and um, so we'll just invite you to stand with us as we sing. Um, and even as we do and as we continue to celebrate, um, that we continue to contemplate and this question and this even fact, right, that Jesus came to save us.